Japan's rich history is filled with intrigue and lots of love stories. For a lot of its history, a rigid caste system coupled with Buddhist and Confucian philosophies created fascinating love and marriage rituals. Family bonds were sacred, duty and honor were sacred, but fall in love with someone from the wrong class and you'd be kicked to the curb, or don't marry at all and you'd be kicked to the curb. Japan is loaded with stories of powerful people falling in and out of love, relationships that change the face of empires and dynasties. From samurai husband and wife warriors fighting side by side, to geishas having affairs with prime ministers. Here's what love and marriage was like in Japan. Samurai Marriage Nothing says I love you like presenting the head of one of your enemies to your husband. Great anniversary gift, right? This is almost exactly what happened between the samurai power couple Tomo Gozen and Minamoto no Yoshinaka in the 1180s, minus the, you know, anniversary part. But before we get into the incredible story of the warrior newlyweds, let's look at samurai marriages in general. Samurai marriages were often arranged through something called omiya, a formal meeting between the families of the prospective bride and groom. Things like social status, compatibility, and family background were debated during these meetings. It didn't really matter whether or not love was in the air, it mattered more that the potential couple and their families could benefit from the arrangement. Once the match was agreed upon, an engagement ceremony was held and the couple exchanged gifts. The actual wedding typically involved a simple ritual where vows were exchanged and sake was shared to seal the union. After the wedding, the bride moved to the groom's family residence, where she would become part of her husband's household. In samurai society, women were generally expected to be loyal and obedient servants of their husbands. They were responsible for things like managing the household and raising children. But some women bucked the norms and became exceptional warriors known as Anna Bogatia. These women received martial arts training and were skilled in different weapons and combat techniques. They were rare, but their existence challenges the conventional view of women's roles in feudal Japan. So back to the samurai couple. Tomu Gozen is one of the most famous Ona Bugeishas in Japanese history. She was a warrior who fought alongside her husband, Minamoto no Yoshinaka, a powerful samurai general during the Genpei War from 1180 to 1185. The war was fought between two rival clans, the Minamoto and the Taita, for control of the islands. It was a pivotal point in Japanese history. It marked the end of the Heian period and the beginning of the Kamakura period when Japan shifted from imperial court-centered rule to the military rule of the shogunate, and for historians, a shift from classical Japan to feudal Japan. Minimoto no Yoshinaka was an ambitious guy. During the Genpei War, he led his army into battle against the Taira, eventually taking the capital of Kyoto, and by his side through all of it was his samurai wife, Tomo Gozen. Tomo Gozen was described as beautiful and fearless, capable of wielding a sword with incredible skill, she was highly respected among Yoshinaka's troops, and her presence on the battlefield reportedly boosted their morale. Gee, I wonder why that was. She commanded as many as 1,000 samurai during the campaigns against the Taira, oftentimes outnumbered. By 1182, Gozid and Yoshinaka had driven the Taira into the remote west, but Yoshinaka soon had a new enemy. His cousin, Minamoto no Yoromoto, was by all accounts the leader of the clan. Yoshinaka wanted the title for himself though, so he basically staged a coup in Kyoto in the middle of the war while they were still technically fighting the Taita. A war within a war was ignited. Yoshinaka and Gozen were eventually pushed out by Kyoto of Yoromoto and his forces. They made their last stand at the Battle of Aozu in 1184, where Gozen was said to have beheaded the leader of the Musashi clan who was fighting alongside Yoromoto's forces and presented it to her husband. The battle was intense. Yoshinaka's forces were outnumbered, and he would be killed as they were retreating. Before his demise, Yoshinaka reportedly told Gozen to flee rather than die with him, but she said no, instead saying that she wanted to take out one more final worthy opponent. It's not certain whether this is fact or legend, but Gozen is said to have charged the enemy on her horse and taken another head in the face of imminent defeat. Pretty bold move if you ask me. The fate of Tomu Gozen is uncertain. Some accounts say she died with her husband in that final battle. Others say she was captured by Yoromoto's forces. Yet another suggests she survived but renounced her warrior ways and became a Buddhist nun. Whatever actually happened, it was ultimately a tragic end to the love story of this samurai power couple. Yoshinaka's cousin, Yorimoto, would go on to become the first shogun of the Kamakura period, 
ushering in the feudal era of military rule in Japan. Geisha Love The origin of the geisha is a pretty fascinating one. Fascinating because they were originally men. Started in the 13th century, Japanese daimyo or feudal lords had their own versions of court jesters called taikomochi. These entertainers were almost entirely male. In the mid-1700s, the first female geisha started appearing on the scene. At the time, women working in Japan's pleasure districts as women of the night were looking for a better way of life and started fashioning themselves as geishas. By 1800, geishas were almost entirely female. Marriage was generally discouraged for geishas while they were actively pursuing their careers in the hanamachi or teahouse districts where they worked. One of the most famous geishas in history was a woman named Sada Yako. Some have described her as the first beauty influencer. If she were around today, she'd probably have millions of Instagram followers. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, she became one of Japan's first international stars, revolutionizing and subverting what a geisha was in the process. And she did it alongside the love of her life, a fellow entertainer, playwright and actor named Kawakami Otojiro. When Yako turned 15, her Mizuich was sold to Ito Hirobumi, the first prime minister of Japan. Basically, Prime Minister Hirobumi paid a pretty hefty sum of money to Yako's geisha house in order to have her around. It wasn't uncommon for geishas to have powerful patrons who provided financial support and protection in exchange for their companionship. And geisha Muzij had this rather exploitive aspect to it until reforms were made in 1956. Yako was Prime Minister Hirobumi's mistress for three years. In 1888, they parted ways, but apparently remained close friends. Shortly after, she met Kawakami Otojiro, a flamboyant and innovative young man who called himself the Liberty Kid. Otojiro was a playwright, actor, and theater director known for being a bit of a wild card. He was in the process of revolutionizing Japanese theater, blending Western influences with traditional performing arts. The two hit it off immediately. Yako and Otojiro started performing together, and their relationship blossomed. Their creative connection turned into a romantic one, and in 1893, they got married. Times were changing, and Yako was definitely subverting the norms as a geisha. By this point, she really wasn't even a geisha, though. She was more of an actor. Otojiro was a trailblazer for modern Japanese theater and started the New Wave Movement, or Chenpa. He even introduced Shakespeare to Japanese audiences. Despite the crazy love they had for each other, Yako and Otojiro's marriage almost fell apart when she found out that he'd had a child with another woman. Yeah, that can be a problem sometimes. But they were bohemian, and their relationship endured, and their success eventually exploded, including wildly successful tours in the United States and Europe. Yako became an international icon. In the summer of 1911, while performing in Osaka, Otojiro was diagnosed with a stomach condition. Inflammation soon spread to his brain, and he went into a coma. Yako insisted that he should be moved from the hospital in Osaka to the Imperial Theater, where he died on stage with Yako by his side. A poetic, theatrical end for a man who lived for the theater. After his death, Yako struck up an affair with a married Japanese businessman named Mamosuke Fukuzawa. Crazy love story, huh? Don't stay single. So let me ask you something. Are you single? You know, being single has its benefits. Maybe you're free to do more of what you want to do. Maybe you don't have kids that are wanting everything off the shelf at stores. Maybe you can travel or even go out at night without having to get a babysitter. But if you remain single for too long in Japan, you'd get looked at kind of funny and maybe pushed out of your community. In feudal and imperial Japan, the concept of family was one of the most important things in society. Family lineage and continuity were top priority and not marrying was considered taboo. Staying single and not producing heirs could lead to social ostracism and disapproval from your family and friends. The pressure to marry and uphold the family name was especially strong for individuals from privileged or noble backgrounds, as they were expected to carry on the family's legacy and maintain social status. Marriage was seen as a duty and responsibility to the family, and those who chose not to marry were often viewed as selfish or weak. They probably got some pretty disapproving looks from their parents or siblings. Maybe they weren't even invited to family gatherings. Despite all the stigma, there were quite a few famous figures who remained bachelors throughout their lives. One of them was Minimoto no Yochisuni, a decorated samurai warrior and military commander who lived during the late Heian period. Man, what's up with all these similar names? You know, he was actually the half-brother of Yoritomo, 
the before said first shogun of the Kamakura shogunate who took out his cousin Yoshinaka and his samurai wife Tomei Gozen. Yoshitsune was a skilled and daring general, known for his military prowess. While he had relationships with women, including a well-known fling with a famous dancer named Shizuka Gozen, there aren't any records of him formally tying the knot. He apparently had a child with Shizuka, but not much is known about him or her. We don't even know if it was a man or woman. Yoshitune and Shizuka were apparently madly in love, but were forced to separate when his half-brother and future shogun, Yoritomo, turned against him and tried to have him killed. For the amount of value placed on family, it's kind of ironic how much of Japan's history has cases of brothers and cousins and sons and fathers turning against each other. I guess power often trumps family, no matter what your values are. Yorimoto's men eventually got to Yoshitune, and before he could be captured, the samurai ran himself through his own sword in a ritual called seppuku. So the moral of the story is, when in Japan, be married. Towards Equality During the Meiji Restoration, which lasted from 1868 to 1912, there was a pretty significant transformation in the norms and practices related to love and marriage. The period marked the end of the feudal era and the beginning of modernization and westernization in Japan. Now, if you're thinking, hmm, maybe this modernized marriage in Japan, maybe things got a bit more progressive. Well, let me tell you something. If you thought that, you'd be wrong. Before the restoration, rural folk in the countryside were often free to court and marry whoever they wanted. Similar to feudal Europe, there just weren't as many rules or social red tape when it came to courtship and marriage. But as Japan started industrializing and people started flocking to the cities, folks from all different social classes and backgrounds started living closer together. The stricter marriage customs, which included arranged marriages that were practiced by the elite like the samurai, ended up becoming the norm for everyone. These traditions bled into education too. The Meiji government implemented widespread public education, making schooling almost universal between 1872 and the early 1900s. A good thing for sure. The expansion of education led to increased literacy and knowledge. And what country doesn't want increased literacy and knowledge towards people? Well, a guy with a little mustache came to mind, but you know what I mean. But like in many Western schools, boys and girls were separated, and piety to family and the nation was prioritized over individual desire. Now, this isn't to say that family traditions and nationalism can be good things. They certainly can. But on the other hand, the heart wants what the heart wants. The Meiji government also introduced the Meiji Civil Code in 1898, which codified different legal aspects of Japanese society, including marriage. Under the Meiji Civil Code, marriage required the permission of the head of the household, aka the father. Men over 30 and women under 25 needed their parents' consent to marry. If you were Japanese at this time, your heart was basically still for hire. Fast forward to the post-World War II era. Japan underwent significant changes under the influence of the Allied occupation and a new constitution. Article 24 of the post-war constitution of Japan, which was enacted in 1947, played a pivotal role in redefining the concept of marriage in Japanese society. Article 24 emphasized the principle of gender equality in marriage, stating that marriage shall be based only on the mutual consent of both sexes. This provision challenged traditional notions of marriage, where women were often considered subordinate to their husbands. The inclusion of mutual consent as a basis for marriage gave people more freedom to choose their partners based on, well, love. The Kusuko Incident The story of Fujiwara no Kusuko and Emperor Heisei is one of the most scandalous and complex tales in Japanese history. It's a love story about a woman caught between two brothers, an emperor who didn't think he was capable of being an emperor, and a brother who wanted power for himself. This tug-of-war drama for the empire unfolded during the early 9th century, from 809 to 810. Fujiwara no Kusuko was a woman from the powerful Fujiwara clan, a clan that held a lot of sway in the Japanese imperial court. She married Emperor Heisei, who ascended to the throne in 806. Kusuko used her position as the emperor's wife to exert a whole lot of behind-the-scenes control over imperial affairs. She was keen on increasing the power and influence of the Fujiwara clan. So she was pretty disappointed when her husband got sick and voluntarily gave the throne to his younger brother, who became Emperor Saga. It's not often that an emperor gives up his throne on his own accord, but Heisei took his illness as an omen of divine punishment. In his mind, abdicating was the only way he could avoid angering the spirits and maintain the stability of the imperial court and the country in general. Emperor Heisei's decision to abdicate the throne made his wife Kusuko pretty furious. 
She was one of the highest ranking court officials when Heisei was on the throne, and now she was a lot less powerful. Her ego definitely took a hit. She and her older brother, Fujiwara no Nakanari, who was a counselor in Heisei's court, were also worried about the diminished power and reputation of the Fujiwara clan. After his abdication, ex-emperor Heisei moved to the old capital of Haijo-kyo and recovered from his illness, but his younger brother started making decisions that Heisei wasn't too happy with, including changes to the country's taxation and inspection systems. So Heisei, egged on by his wife, decided to establish a competing court and challenge the authority of Saga's rule. With Kusuko and Nakanari's encouragement, Emperor Heisei started thinking he should maybe be the emperor again, and he set about trying to restore his power and reclaim the throne, leading to increased tension between the two imperial courts. Retired emperors like Heisei did still have the authority to involve themselves in politics, but a full-on coup wasn't exactly encouraged. In the autumn of 810, Heisei issued a declaration that the capital of the empire should be moved from Heian-kyo, which would later become Kyoto, to his new residence in Hayo-kyo. This didn't make Saga very happy, he imprisoned Kusuku's brother and then stripped the ex-empress of her titles. Heisei and Kusuko decided it was time for a full-on armed conflict. They headed off to try to gather an army to fight Saga, but were foiled by Saga's forces. In the aftermath, Kusuko's brother was put to death, one of the rarest carried out killings in the Heian period. It would be another 350 years before another one officially happened. Kusuko would soon join her brother except on her own accord. She was gone shortly after drinking poison. A devastated and heartbroken Heisei was shown mercy by his younger brother and was allowed to live. Forbidden Love During various periods in Japanese history, relationships between people of different social classes were considered, I don't know, taboo and a pretty big no-no. Rigid social hierarchies placed strict boundaries on interactions and romantic relationships between people from different classes. These restrictions were most noticeable during feudal Japan, where the caste system and Confucian principles reinforced the importance of maintaining social order and stability. But despite these societal norms, there are plenty of juicy stories of people who broke the taboos and had relationships across class boundaries. Here's one of the most famous examples of a guy who bucked the system to become one of the most powerful men in the history of Japan and his love life along the way. Toyotomi Hideyoshi came from humble beginnings. Born in 1537, he was the son of a peasant and a lowly foot soldier for a samurai general. His family's social status was so low, they didn't even have a surname. Despite his commoner status, Hideyoshi would go on to become the most powerful general in the country and would eventually unify Japan for the first time in centuries. His reign as the de facto ruler of Japan was marked by significant political and social reforms that laid the groundwork for the later Tokugawa shogunate. But early on, he was still working to legitimize his ascent into the upper class. In 1561, long before he rose to become Japan's head honcho, he married a woman named Nene. Nene came from a noble background. She was the descendant of a Taiga emperor. Her mother and family had arranged a marriage with a high-ranking samurai general. But for whatever reason, she fell for Hideyoshi. Her family? Not pleased. Hideyoshi was a peasant, a commoner. He wasn't the descendant of an emperor like Nene was but things would soon change. Hideyoshi rose up the ranks to become a key part of the warlord Oda Nobunaga's army, who by 1582 had conquered nearly half of Japan. But then Nobunaga was killed by one of his own generals, Akechi Mitsuhide, who went rogue and descended on an unsuspecting Nobunaga with an army of 13,000 men while he was at a ceremony in Kyoto. Man, back then you couldn't take a day off. Hideyoshi was often fighting a rival clan, but when he heard the news, he came rampaging back and wiped out Mitsuhide and his army, becoming the new de facto ruler of Japan. In 1585, Hideyoshi was legitimized by the imperial court and given the Toyotomi clan name, Toyotomi Hideyoshi then went about conquering the rest of Japan. He unified over 250 warring princedoms into a single unified country, eventually bringing peace to most of the islands. And Nene, she was right there with him the whole time. I mean, the two were reportedly genuinely in love. Nene was a devoted and supportive wife throughout Hideyoshi's career. She was strong-willed and known for her ability to manage domestic affairs, which allowed Hideyoshi to focus on his political ambitions and military campaigns. They never had kids, which was another unconventional aspect of their relationship, but Hideyoshi had plenty of concubines for that. In a lot of cultures, with more power comes, well, more women. This was certainly true in feudal Japan, Hideyoshi was described as a scrawny, balding guy, but nevertheless, he had game. 
He pulled in ladies with his power, his charisma, and charm. A Jesuit priest who visited his court claimed that he had over a hundred concubines. This might be an overestimate, but Hideyoshi certainly had quite a few of them. One of the most influential was a woman named Chacha, who would go on to become Lady Yodo. Lady Yodo was famously beautiful and famously demanding. She wanted her own castle and Hideyoshi built one for her, Castle Yodo, located between Kyoto and Osaka. Unlike Nene, she bore Hideyoshi two children. The first, Surumatsu, sadly passed when he was just two. The second, Hideyori, would become heir. However, things didn't turn out well for either Lady Yodo or Hideyori. In 1589, Hideyoshi died. He was bedridden for a while and passed away from an unspecified illness with both Lady Yoda and Nene by his side. The two would have a deadly falling out. A power struggle ensued. Hideyori was still too young to become the shogun, and a guy named Tokugawa Ieyasu, the leader of the Tokugawa clan, rose up to depose the young heir and take the shogunate for himself. Lady Yodo obviously backed her son, but Nene ended up backing Ieyasu. In 1603, Ieyasu was declared shogun by the emperor. The Tokugawa shogunate would rule Japan for the next 265 years until the Meiji Restoration in 1868. An uneasy truce was brokered between Lady Yodo and Tokugawa Ieyasu, but in 1615, Ieyasu had enough of the potential threat still posed by Hideyoshi's heir. He lay siege to the castle of Osaka, where the mother and son lived, ending the Toyotomi line. Nene, on the other hand, made out pretty well. She was smart to back the Tokugawa clan. She became a Buddhist nun and helped build a temple in Kyoto where she lived out the rest of her life as a respected and influential elder. Thanks for watching. What else do you want to know about Japanese history? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe for more nutty history.